Let's learn Kubernetes by example. In this video, you will see how your application code gets deployed in Kubernetes from scratch. Here, we will create a simple application that talks with a MySQL database and deploy both app and DB in Kubernetes. Set up persistent storage for our DB. See how to roll out updates and scale up both manually and automatically. Finally, explore different ways to set up access, both from inside and outside the cluster. So we have our application code, which hopefully a microservice. I said hopefully a microservice, because no one's stopping you from deploying your monolithic application into a Kubernetes cluster. But you won't be able to benefit from all the awesome features or the flexibility that Kubernetes was built to offer. Now, we need to create a container image that runs our application. A container is a lightweight executable that is packaged with software code and just the operating system libraries and dependencies required to run that specific code. We do this with the help of a Dockerfile. Dockerfile is a template that includes things like what base image you are using, and where your source code is located and where it should be copied to inside the container, and what ports should be exposed, and set of instructions or commands that should be executed to build or configure your application or executed during the runtime. Then you put those together and run a Docker build, you get your containerized image of your application. You can now push it to your private or public repository. You can containerize web apps or web services or APIs or databases or message queues or anything you want. We have our web service container. Now it has to be deployed in a Kubernetes cluster. In Kubernetes, the smallest deployable object is a pod and a pod acts as a layer of abstraction. Meaning, you can put only one container to your pod or multiple containers. For example, our web service and the database which it talks to can coexist in the same pod. There are use cases for both single container as well as multi-container pods. But I find it easier to troubleshoot single container pods due to its simplicity and scheduling issues that multi-container pods have. Because, if something happens, you will know which container is getting restarted, at a single glance. In order to create a pod, we have to create pod's definition in YAML format, referring the container image and apply that into the cluster. Pods are ephemeral components in nature. And if one of your pods gets killed, and when Kubernetes recreate that pod, based on your pod's restart policy, you probably won't get your previous IP. So what happens if your web service is communicating with the database via pods cluster IPs and it DB pod got restarted with a new IP? To solve this, Kubernetes uses a special resource called a service. It acts as an abstract way to expose an application running on a set of pods as a network service. In a way, it is sort of a load balancer as well. The set of pods targeted by a service is usually determined by a selector. This means that we can have multiple instances of the web service pod with the same selector and the service will balance the incoming traffic between them. Note, when you are creating the database pod, you will have to use the same label that is used in the service definition in its metadata for this to work. Once the service is created, you can reference the service name instead of the database IP in the application code. There are cases you may need services without a selector as well. For example, if you have two separate environments for staging and production, each with separate external databases, you can configure your application to talk to the same service name, so there won't be any code changes. This way, you will be able to deploy same set of pods and services into another cluster, but direct the traffic to respective DB. Now that we have the flexibility of replacing the database IP with a more flexible service name, let's not stop there. Still the things like database name, database username, or password and the database IP or the service name that we've just replaced it with are all hard-coded into the application code. This is not very portable or secure. Kubernetes solves this with secrets and config maps. As the name suggests, a config map is an API object used to store non-confidential data in key-value pairs. 
such as username or database name. It also comes in handy to initialize the database when creating our MySQL pod as well. MySQL Docker image provides us with a special location called entrypoint.d. When the container is started for the first time, it will execute files with extensions .sh, .sql, and .sql.gz that are found in that location. So, we can create a config map with all the commands we need to initialize the DB, such as creating users, DBs and tables, granting permissions, insert dummy record, etc., and mount it in that location. And secret contains a small amount of sensitive data such as passwords. But keep in mind that by default, Kubernetes do not store secrets encrypted at rest. They are just base64 encoded. Anyone with API access can retrieve or modify a secret. But if you want additional security, you can enable encryption at rest for secrets. Or configure RBAC rules that restrict reading data in secrets. And, where appropriate, you can also use mechanisms such as RBAC to limit which principles are allowed to create new secrets or replace existing ones. So now that we have config maps and secrets, we can expose them to our pod's environmental variable and use the variable name in our code. One thing to keep in mind though, is that config maps and secrets both reside in a namespace. Meaning they can only be referenced by the pods in that same namespace. But that's not the only problem we have to solve due to this ephemeral nature. What about data persistence in stateful applications? This is important when it comes to applications such as databases. In Kubernetes you can configure your pods to have persistent storage mounted. For this, Kubernetes have two API resources. Persistent Volume and Persistent Volume Claim. Persistent Volume is a cluster resource that is provisioned manually by either an administrator or dynamically using a storage class. You can define your storage classes and map different storage provisioners such as AWS Elastic Block Store, GlusterFS, NFS, Longhorn or Local for example and with reclaim policies to be either delete or retain. And it has other configurable options like mount options, binding mode and many parameters depending on the provisioner you use. Persistent storage claim on the other hand is a request for storage by a user which consumes previously provisioned persistent or dynamic volume. It supports access modes such as read write once or read only many or read write many. If we want to scale up our web service, we just have to deploy another pod with a different name and the service resource will load balance the traffic. So we got our web service and the database in separate pods. What if we need to update the web service version? First we will have to deploy a new web service pod and then delete old pod so there will be no downtime. Well, that's one way of doing it, but involves a lot of manual work, not to mention the mistakes that can happen. Just think if we had 50 instances of web service pods instead of one. In another scenario, what happens if one web server pod or more importantly the DB pod fails? If the pod were to fail unexpectedly, Kubernetes Kubelt service would restart the pod. Pods have an always restart policy by default, but only to the node that it is first bound. Meaning, if that node fails, the pod will not be rescheduled into another node. This is why Kubernetes has introduced the concept called replica set. Replication controller, in this case, will manage pods' health across nodes. Just like services, the targeted pods are identified by a selector. Once you have your replica set, you can perform operations like scaling up or down with no hassle. So if we wanted to perform an upgrade, we will have to deploy a new replica set with a new selector so it will not conflict with the previous one, and then delete old replica set once it's successfully deployed. That sounds better than the manual method, but it's not ideal. <laughs> 
it's still prone to a lot of human errors, and not to mention that your cluster needs to have resources to host two sets of pod groups at the same time. What's better than a replica set? Deployments. It is one step higher in the abstraction hierarchy. Deployments control both replica sets and pods in a declarative manner. Meaning, you don't have to use replica sets directly. Instead you use deployments which abstracts those features, plus it brings more into the table, such as rolling updates. It has the concepts of actual state and the desired state. Deployments helps your pods to reach the desired state. Which means, just like replica sets, if one pod gets killed, the deployment controller kicks in and will spin up a new pod. And when you need to perform an update, deployment controller will be creating updated pods whilst slowly killing old pods. This is called a rollout. There's even more. If somehow, your updated version has problems, such as a buggy code or you replace the base image but it has compatibility issues with some of your existing code, which wasn't identified earlier. You can always roll back on the fly. Replica sets doesn't support that. This is an example of an upgrade. Pausing the rollout. And then resuming it back again. Undo the rollout. And you can even revert back to a specific revision. Just like replica sets, we can scale up or scale down deployments on the fly. But it is still a manual work. With horizontal pod autoscaler, you can automatically scale the number of pods in a replication controller, deployment, replica set or stateful set, based on observed metrics such as average CPU utilization, average memory utilization or any other custom metric to the target specified by the user. HPA is implemented as a control loop, with a period controlled by the controller manager with a default value of 15 seconds. The API that HPA queries to get metrics is usually provided by metric server, which needs to be launched separately. So if you get unknown for target metric value, you probably haven't set up metric server on your cluster. Now that we have enabled Autoscaler to our deployment, we can see it scale up with the increased load generated from our attack script. We took care of our web service pod, which is stateless. But our MySQL database on the other hand, is stateful. Meaning, pods needs to maintain its state such as host names, storage, IPs etc. Earlier, we were using MySQL pod with persistent storage attached. But this way we cannot scale it up because data will not be consistent. Kubernetes have something called a stateful set for this very purpose. It is similar to deployment. But, unlike a deployment, a replica in a stateful set is not identical. And when scaling down, it will delete the latest pod, not a random pod like when we scale down a deployment. This is one of the reasons why, instead of giving random hashes at the end of the pod name for its identifier, it places a fixed ordered name, comprised with stateful set name and an ordinal. And this is a sticky name. Meaning, if a pod is killed in a stateful set, the new replacement pod will have the same name. Unlike a web server or a Java application, scaling up a database pod is a little different. When scaling up, not only the pod, new persistent volumes are also created. For example, in case of MySQL, you need to configure your first pod to be your master, and any replicas after that as slaves with read-only access to the data. Data from master pod also needs to be replicated. Keep in mind, we need to configure two services for MySQL. One for writing data to master node only. And the other one to read data from replicas. We can refer those services in our application code in relevant places for insert and select queries. We got our web service and database properly set up. Now it's time to set up access. <laughs> 
As explained earlier, we will obviously be accessing a service that is pointed to a workload. There are several types of services. Cluster IP, which is the default service type, but limited to only inside the cluster. Node port. Exposes the service on each node on a static port ranging between 30,000 to 32,767. Usually, this is not considered secured because it exposes a port directly on the host. This will require multiple node ports exposed for each set of workloads you want to access. We have another service type called Load Balancer. Load Balancer type is able to configure an external load balancer to expose the service cluster IP. Most of the cloud providers support this. If you are on-prem, you can set up your existing load balancer such as F5 or Citrix which they already support, or set it up yourself with something like Metal LB. But in case of cloud providers, using this type can be expensive, because it will be automatically provisioning a load balancer service, every time you expose a service. To get around that, you can use an ingress. Ingress, is not a service type. It is an API object that exposes HTTP and HTTPS routes from outside the cluster to services within the cluster. Traffic routing is controlled by rules defined on the ingress resource. Under the hood, it will use a node port or load balancer service to expose itself to the world so it can act as that proxy. But since the traffic is routed based on the ingress rules we define, we do not need multiple load balancers or node ports. For example you can create a cluster IP service in front of your web service and then create an ingress that points to that cluster IP service, defining the hostname you want to use. Then, after you configure DNS for that hostname pointing your cluster, ingress controller will route traffic towards one of the services, depending on the hostname. In this video, we learned about Kubernetes basic concepts in action. Thank you for watching. And stay tuned for more videos like this.